Good evening, Forever Family. My name is Rich, and I am a faithful believer in Jesus Christ and a recovering addict. Hey, Psalms 118.24 says, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hey, would everybody stand up and join me in saying the eight principles, please? Realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendencies to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to care and control. Happy are the meek. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt, and to make amends for harm that I have done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the peacemakers. Reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. Happy are the merciful. Yield myself to God to be used to bring good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Thank you, guys. Again, I'm Pastor Mike, grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, welcome to Celebrate Recovery. If this is your first time here, know that this is a 12-step Christ-centered program. Okay? I know people have done 12 steps and it hasn't worked for them. Maybe you didn't have Christ in it then. But I know this works, and so if you work the program, it works for you. Amen? So tonight I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, first is baptism... We're having a bad celebrate recovery baptism next Friday night. Okay. So I have about seven people on the list right now. So if you want to get baptized next Friday, come and see me. Uh, I'll be out the double doors at the end of the service tonight. I'll take your name and your number. That way I can check on you, make sure you're still going to get baptized. But we're going to fill up this baptistry, and it's going to be like 80 degrees. And so it'll be nice. And so if you want to get baptized, have the Holy Spirit come upon you, come on in. And if you come next week, forget your shorts, we'll baptize you. In your clothes, but we'll baptize you. Okay. So the other thing is uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Barry and uh, Devon are down in Florida right now, so they're not here this Friday. And Pastor Aaron's got something he's got going on as well. So... Uh, I just want to make this announcement. Some of you guys already know this, is but today I'm excited because today is my last day of full-time ministry. Amen. Now, it's kind of bittersweet, but you know what? I'm going to continue doing celebrate recovery 
ministering to the least, the last, and the lost. I'm going to continue to do jail ministry because those are my passions. Okay? So I'm still going to do ministry, just not as much of it. And so I'm going to do a lot of fishing and a lot of other things, too, and I'm looking forward to. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to pray for uh, Pastor uh, Steve as he comes forward to give us a message tonight. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you and praise you uh, for what you're doing here in this ministry, Lord. This is your ministry, and we're just your hands and feet. So just use Steve right now. Give him the words, Lord, that you've laid on his heart, and open up our ears and our hearts that we may be receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. I do. I do. I'm ready to retire. You got that right. <laughs> I am Steve Miller. I'm a faith believer in Jesus Christ. I deal with the, thanks guys, I dealt with alcoholism and codependency. So thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. So if you have picked up your spiritual inventory acrostic at the door, we're going to go ahead and knock this thing out, right? Because I'm going to get talking and who knows where I'll end up talking about or what, who knows. We're going to go ahead and knock this acrostic out. It's on. It's on. It's red. Red's on, right? You might need to turn me up a little bit. <coughs> it's not on. It's red, so. See, you can hear me in this room. All right. We'll go to plan B. There we go. We got all kinds of stuff now. All right, we're going to plan B. Um, so if you have your acrostic, let's go ahead and knock that out real quick. Um, everybody got that pen ready to go? Sorry, I'm playing around and just seeing where things are going to go. Okay, so the first one is your mind. Your mind, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The second one is your body. Have you not let yet learned your body is the home of the Holy Spirit, your body? The third one is your family. But if you are unwilling to obey the Lord, then decide today whom you will obey. But as far as me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Then the fourth one is church. Let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do. But encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming is drawing near. Mind, body, family, and church. That's what we're going to talk about today. And now, we're going to test all the equipment out today. All right. Got a light. There we go. Openly ex examine and confess my faults to God, myself, and someone I trust. <clears throat> Happy are the pure in heart. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. So those, this is the area where we're starting to get into those touchy things, right? Those personal things where we got to reflect on our own lives because let's face it as we deal with addictions and we overcome those things they don't really get real to us until we start looking in ourselves until we start looking at what's wrong with us until we start listing those things down in our inventory it really doesn't hit home does it it's just something we go through but tonight we're going to look at the second part of our spiritual inventory and uh, in Scripture, Psalms 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything you find in me that makes you sad and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now think about that prayer. That is a tough prayer right there. If you're praying to God to search your heart and test your thoughts. Now I don't know about you, but I have thoughts that go through my mind that I don't want God to know. That I don't want anybody to know. It's like, why am I even thinking that, right? And then it says, point out anything you find that makes you sad. Now, how many of you love to have your faults pointed out to you? No. 
We don't like that, do we? We like to pretend we don't have faults. But this is praying to God to point out our faults. That's a tough prayer. Then it says, lead me along a path of everlasting life. So tonight we're going to finish our spiritual inventory, and we will look at some of those additional shortcomings or sins that uh, can prevent us from having eternal salvation with God. We're going to look at those things. Evaluating each area will help you complete your spiritual inventory. So Pastor Mike, a few weeks back, he talked about David and Bathsheba. Anybody remember that, the story of David and Bathsheba? Well, Pastor Mike talked about that, and it was a beautiful but married woman. Uh, She became pregnant after David saw her bathing on the rooftop, and he had brought her to him. And then David then ordered Uriah, which was her husband, to be moved to the front line of the battle, okay, where he was killed. David knew that was going to happen. That's why he put him there. And David married the widow Bathsheba, but the first child died as punishment for David's adultery, the murder of Uriah. David repented of his sins, and Bathsheba later gave birth to Solomon. David did not guard his mind when he saw Bathsheba. Because let's let's face it, when he saw her, he could have turned away, right? Or he could have just thought, okay, that's a beautiful woman, but she's married, and i got to quit looking at that. But instead, he decided to let his mind go down that path of what if, right? Anybody ever let your mind go down a path you probably shouldn't? Just You want to think it out, don't you? I mean, everything from big to small, even things like winning the lottery. I don't even play the lottery, but there's times when I let my mind go down that path of, well, what if I did? What would I do with that, right? We let our minds wander because we just, we just want to think about what ifs, don't we? But David, he let his mind wander. Then other things started to follow. We have said this before, that the most difficult thing you can open is a closed mind. Romans 12, 2 says this. It gives us a clear direction regarding our minds, though. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and his perfect will. God's perfect will, not our twisted mind of what what the will is, but God's perfect will. Because let's face it, we don't know what perfect is, do we? We were born in a broken world, we've lived in it our whole lives, and we've done nothing but sin. So we don't know what perfect is, but our goal needs to be we're going to get a little bit better each day. Now, I don't know about you, I can't compare myself to other people in the room because, you know, I fall short. Because I can promise you, every one of you are better at me than something in this world. So when I compare myself to you, no matter what that is, I fall short, and I'm going to start feeling bad about that. But when it comes to our spiritual life and our minds and what God has for us, we can't compare ourselves to other people because God has a special design for you, and we cannot compare ourselves to each other. It's not what God wants us to do. He does want us to compare our actions to Jesus and understand what he wants. But have you ever guarded your mind in the past? Guarding your mind, I'm going to say, denied something you know it's there so you just deny to acknowledge that anybody ever guard your mind and deny something yeah we've done that sure we have once again we need to see and examine how we cope with our denial you may have protected that that denial may have protected you from a pain for short term but in the long term it does nothing good It's preventing you from living and dealing with reality. Denial is preventing you from dealing with reality. You know the two thoughts cannot occupy your mind at the same time? Think about that. If you're really thinking about something, you can't think about something else fully with your whole mind, can you? If you're sitting there trying to do a math problem in your mind, you can't think about reading a book. You just can't do it. You've got to focus on one or the other. And the same thing is with God. It's our spiritual life. You're going to either work towards good or you're working towards what? Bad, right? So we got to have one thought, and that thought needs to guide us closer to God. It's our choice whether our thoughts will be constructive or destructive. Will your thoughts be positive or negative? And if you're like me, you're going to have both throughout the day. You're going to have good thoughts and you're going to have bad thoughts. 
You're going to have negative and you're going to have positive. But you can guard your mind by choosing. Now listen to this. This is something that I guarantee you, everybody in this room that's dealt with any kind of addictions, any kind of issues, has one of these areas. That you It's choosing your friends, your companions, and any other relationship. Now, if you think about those three things, there's probably some bad ones in there when it comes to your addiction, isn't there? You probably got some bad friends. You probably got some bad companions. You got some bad relationships that fostered you down the wrong path, didn't they? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the thing is when I started to become a Christian and I started following God, I lost all my friends. I was like, man, this Christian thing kind of stinks. Or is all my buddies, right? Well, they weren't really my buddies, were they? No, they just wanted to have a good time. They wanted to have fun. If you were doing what they were doing, if you were buying, if you were driving or whatever, then they're your friends. But as soon as you quit doing that stuff, you're not their friend anymore, right? So those relationships is how we can guard our mind. <clears throat> the Bible is clear when it tells us to choose our companions wisely because the company you keep determines the type of person you are. Think about that. The company you keep determines the type of person you are. Man, we like to deny that one, don't we? We like to deny it. Maybe they're doing things you don't do anymore, but you used to do. Maybe you're just condoning them doing it. Is that okay? No, it's not. But we tell ourselves it is. Well, they're doing it, but I'm not going to do it. It's all right. But you're condoning it, right? You're letting them do it. You're not telling them, hey, that's wrong. Don't do that in front of me. Because where I am, I try to, try to take room with God, take God with me. If there's no room for God, I don't want to be there. So if your friends don't have room for you, then don't put up with it. But we do. We condone it. That's just as guilty as the person doing it. In law, it's the same thing, right? Anyone found hiding someone from the police or evidence from the police is held an accessory to the crime, aren't they? They're going to get convicted just as the person who did it. Your, your chosen companions and friends should be friends who love Jesus. Look for friends that will tell you about Jesus. And look for friends that will lift you up. That will tell you when your heart has made a wrong choice. Now think about that. <clears throat> You need a friend that's going to tell you when you've made a bad decision. Now, I've had friends like that, and I wasn't ready for that friend. And when they told me I did something bad, guess what I did to that friend? I don't need you anymore. You're not a very good friend. You just hurt my feelings. Well, <laughs> I needed my feelings hurt because I was doing something stupid, right? I needed that. But you need friends that will do that. Don't choose friends that will support whatever you do. Don't choose friends that will support the wrong motives and bad intentions, and don't be that kind of friend either. I don't want you to be that kind of friend. I want you to be a friend that's honest and tell your friends that they're doing wrong. Let them know they're going down the wrong path. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first started doing that, I felt terrible. I felt like a hypocrite because I had done bad things in my past, and I didn't want to point it out to somebody. But you know what? It depends on where your heart is at. Don't do it to pick on somebody. Do it to help them. I know Pastor Mike says it all the time. We're not here for a handout. We're here for a hand up. You're not here to slap somebody down. You're here to say, here's what you're doing wrong. Let me help you get through that. Let me help you get through that. <clears throat> but don't allow your friends to guide you away from God. Allow God to direct your hearts and their hearts and their desires any advice given to those by those friends, <clears throat> if they go against God, you need to not listen to it. Think about it. If it goes against what the Bible tells you, don't do it. Don't do it. Have you filled your mind <clears throat> with hurtful and unhealthy movies, internet sites, television programs, magazines, books, anything like that that uh, you know is wrong? Have you ever filled your mind with with those things and we've all done it we've all done it and I know you can get on these on your phone and get on these websites and you may not even be looking for those kind of websites but they pop right up and if you click on the wrong button before you know it you are in a place you really don't want to be do you 
You're like, how did I get here? But you go down that rabbit hole, and there you are. You know, you got to be careful. You got to guard yourself. Your ears and your eyes are the doors and windows to your soul. So remember, put good in, you get good out. You put bad in, you get bad out. That's the truth. So living on the straight and narrow cannot come from crooked thinking. It's not going to happen. Proverbs 15, 14 tells us this. The discerning heart seeks knowledge by mouth of a fool needs feeds on folly. Let me read that again. The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. So let's not do that. Let's seek the wisdom and knowledge from those that we know have been there and done that, and they know how to get better. Let's seek their knowledge. Next, let's look at our body. It says, do you... 1 Corinthians 6 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now think about that. That's a tough one, right? It's our body, so we think we can do with it whatever we want. But it's not. It's what we do with it. Any of you ever mistreat your body with drugs, alcohol, food, sex, whatever? There's every person in this room has done that. Every person in this room has mistreated their body in one way or another. And your body is the temple of God, right? You fill that with the Holy Spirit, and that's the vessel that's going to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to this broken world. And when you're filling that vessel up with bad, you're not going to be able to deliver the good, are you? You just can't do it. So we've got to get rid of that bad order to make room for the good. It is through our bodies, though, and our flesh that Satan will work. But thank God for the believer's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God freely gives us the grace of his Holy Spirit. He values us so much that he chose a place his spirit can, can rest within us. You know, and that's the thing is we need to have a much deeper respect for ourselves because the creator of this earth did. Amen. You know, and I've been dealing, you guys know, you guys have prayed for me. I've been dealing with my own physical issues, you know, for the last year. For the last year. And many of you know, some of you may not. Um, they thought I had a stroke. They found a tumor. There's so many things going on. And I didn't abuse my body to come up with those things, but they happened, right? So now I need to seek God and pray over that. And give it to him and try to take better care of myself. Because this is the only body I'm going to have here on earth. So I better do what I can to take care of it a little better. So the old days of abusing it with drugs and alcohol and sex and trouble, those days probably were not good on my body. But thank the Lord I made it this far. And now I just need to continue to improve each day. Because the creator of the universe is who created me and you. What activities or habits cause harm to your physical health? Remember, it, is, it was God, the creator, who made you. Psalms 139 tells us, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before one of them came to be. Many people say that they have the right to do whatever they want. How they can treat their bodies however they want. They're 21 years old and they can do whatever they want, right? Well, that's true. Although there's a price with that kind of freedom if you abuse your body, isn't there? You become enslaved to certain desires. And you know what? That's what happened to many of us when we decided to drink too much or smoke too much or do whatever we did. We become captive to those desires, didn't we? We ultimately gave in. We were enslaved by them. It caused us great harm to our bodies, physically and spiritually. It caused us harm because we gave in to those desires. We thought, we can do whatever we want. I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want. That's true, but every action has a consequence, doesn't it? And God's not going to take those consequences away. You know, and I know I got many friends that's, you know, well, yeah, I'm 
I'm still on in home or I'm st- I got three years probation. And, you know, they're all bent out of shape. And it's like, where's God in that? God wants me to not have my license for five years. God wants that. Nope, God does not want that. But you made decisions to get you there. God's not going to take away your consequences, but God will be with you through them. God will help you through them if you lean on him. God will put people in your life to get you from point A to point B. God will put people there to draw you closer to him. You know, and that's the prayer is, one, that we get closer to God. But the second prayer is that we bring other people closer to God. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. The next thing we want to talk about is family, your family. In the Old Testament, Israel leader Joshua made it made a bold statement regarding his household. And you've heard this one a lot. It says, if you are unwilling to obey the Lord, then decide today whom you will obey. But for me and my house, my family, we will serve the Lord. For him and his house, he will serve the Lord. And this is a tough one. This is a tough one. I know we've had a lot of people, it's like, well, you know, I grew up in a bad house. I grew up, it was rough, and I get that. But you know what? You don't have to carry that legacy on, do you? you? I know many of you in here, you are the generation that stopped that stuff in your life. You are the generation that said, uh-uh, no more. I may have grown up that way, but I'm not going to continue that way. And that's what this is about. This is where you need to draw your strength and say, you know what? But my past is not going to define me. My past is not going to define my children. My past is not going to define anything going forward. Because it doesn't have to. You don't have to let it. You do not have to let it. (coughs) But perhaps you have physically or emotionally mistreated someone in your family. Emotionally, emotional abuse doesn't have to take the form of raging or yelling or screaming. Tearing down a children, a child, or a spouse's self-esteem, being emotionally unavailable to them are both ways that you could have harmed people. And these things are tough because these are things like, you start looking at things of how you treat people. You start looking at them because if you're like me, sometimes you get mad and you just want to be mad. Anybody ever done that? Yeah. You're like, I know I shouldn't be mad, but I'm mad, and I'm going to continue to be mad till I feel like not being mad anymore. That can be emotionally damaging to people. It can be. I know we want to be mad, and you may have a good right to be mad. You may, have, you may be just in your anger. But you shouldn't do it if it's going to cause harm to someone. God designed families to be a safe haven, safety from life's storms. Now, don't let people upset your family dynamic. We must keep it focused on God. If someone in your family is pulling you away from God, maybe you need to separate from them, draw closer to God, and pray for those folks. Don't let them pull you from God. Don't let that happen. You know, and you may say, well, there's nobody in my family that knows God, so all of them are pulling me from God. You have a forever family right here. You can come here anytime, and we will pray for you. We will be there in good times and bad. You're not alone. Family doesn't have to just be your blood, does it? No. I know when I had issues and I started calling people, it was people like Pastor Mike and Pastor Aaron and Pastor Barry and many of you folks in this room. Because that was my family that I needed to hear from. They might not have been my blood family, but those are the folks I needed to hear from. I need to know I'm going to be all right. And if I'm not going to be all right, I need to know that somebody's got my back, right? So when it says family, it's not just a blood family. It's your Christian family. It's the body of Christ. It's all of us. But uh, let's celebrate recovery. Be your family if, if you're missing that part in your life. And pray for those who pull from God in your family. Amen? Pray for them. Anybody in here have somebody in your family that doesn't follow Jesus? Yeah, we've all got somebody that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we pray for them daily, don't we? I think that's probably, that's probably our biggest prayer. We pray every day, and I think that's our biggest prayer, is to bring those, Jesus, bring those folks who do not know you to know you. Put good people in their lives, because... You know, the thing is, is people say, well, why do, you, why do you go to celebrate every Friday? Why do you do that? You have a whole other church. You have a nine-to-five job. Why do you go to celebrate recovery? Because this is the passion God has put on my heart, 
and in my family. And I'm not going to stop until everybody I know knows about Jesus Christ and knows a way to pull away from their addiction. I'm not going to stop. Because there may be somebody in my family that needs to hear from you. And there may be somebody in your family that needs to hear from me. Right? Because let's face it, when I was growing up, my parents was telling me all the right things. I didn't want to hear a word they had to say. Didn't care. Didn't want to hear it. Didn't matter. Then I talked to some stranger that I began to build a relationship with, and then I started to listen. Now, they may have told me the exact same thing my parents told me, but I was willing to listen to them. I wasn't willing to listen to my parents. So the reason I do this is because somebody you know may need me to talk to them because somebody I know may need you to talk to them. So you gotta, you got to put it out there. you gotta, you got to love first, don't you? But all you are really looking for in this part is what part of that relationship is your responsibility? What part of those relationships is your responsibility? And that's the tough part, isn't it? It's like, man, now i got to eat crow. Now i got to go apologize. Now i got to go make amends. Now i got to, and you start thinking about what you, what skin you got in this game, right? That gets a little tougher. That gets a little tougher, though. What is the family issue you've been denying? What's that family secret? Pray about it. Give it to God. Because we all have them. We all have tough situations, don't we? we got to give those things to God. We can't carry them around like a bag of rocks, right? Jeremiah 6, 14 tells us, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. Now think about that. How many times we try that? If we ignore it, it'll go away, right? we ignore it, it'll pass. Well, it might, but it might not, right? We cannot ignore it. we got to go after it. The next topic I want to talk about is your church. Maybe, maybe not. There we go. Your church. Have you been faithful to your church in the past? Let us not neglect our church meetings, as some people do, but encourage the, and warn each other, especially now that the day is coming back, is drawing, he is coming back, is drawing near. The church, the church. Have you been faithful to your church? And for many of us, this is church. This is church, right? I get so tired of people saying, well, those folks need to go to church. Let's see. We're in a church building. We're listening to church music. We're talking about church scripture. How much more church do you need for crying out loud? This is church, right? You may not like my attitude. You may not like that it, our past, but this is church, and we are God's children. This is just as much a church as any church in the United States today, isn't it? Amen. Give yourself a round of applause. Absolutely. Because you know what? You, he just sat up here and said, we're going to have seven baptisms this week. You know how many churches in this country have not had seven baptisms in the past five years? It would knock your socks off. And you guys are going to have seven in one day. Maybe eight. I'm praying for eight. I'm praying for eight. But you guys are there. The church is like a bank. The more you put into it, the more interest you gain in it. Have you been critical of people in church? Now, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Anybody been critical of people at church? Yeah, raise your hand because we have, right? We get tired of old Mildred over there talking about us all the time, pointing her finger at us, right? I know I'm a pastor, and I've felt that way, like they're pointing at me because they were. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I want to keep this guy around or not, right? But we get critical of people. You don't, if you don't like something in your church, get involved and try to find a way to change it or at least make it better, help understand it of what it is and why it is. Instead of turning to grumbling, turn it into service, right? I'm a good grumbler. I'm a good complainer. i, I got to be honest. I can't lie, right? I'm good at grumbling. It's like, oh, why did they do that today? I wouldn't have done that, you know? Why didn't they call me? I should have had a voice in this uh, 
new piano that we got here, you know, we just grumble, right? God doesn't like grumbling. He likes us to take action. Have you discouraged your family's support of their church? Now, think about this. Think about this. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Many times we say, our church is right. And those other ones, they're just not quite right. We get critical, don't we? We get critical. And we're like, even, you know, you know, Uncle Larry comes over for Christmas dinner and he talks about his church. I'm like, I wouldn't go to that church. There's a lot of crazy people go there, right? We get critical of other people's church and how they worship. We shouldn't do that. We're not the judge. God's the judge, right? No more than we want them to judge our church. We shouldn't judge theirs. Now, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them that they're all going by the Bible. But uh, we shouldn't judge people and turn them away from church. But don't stop the rest of your family from experiencing the joy and support of the church family. Allow them to enjoy their church, right? You know, there's many churches represented here today. There's many of them, right? I don't go to Logansport Church on Sunday. I have my own church, right? But many of you have other churches you go to, too. But you know what? It's all the body of Christ, isn't it? As long as we're reading the Bible and we're doing what God wants us to do, when we get up to heaven and we go up there, St. Peter's not going to have like six doors and say, well, here's the door for the Baptists, and here's the door for Logansport Church, and here's the door for Pleasant Hill Church. Yeah, okay, if you walk in that door, you're all in one big room, aren't you? There's only one heaven, there's only one God, and that's just the way it is. We've got to make sure that we're following Him. You know, and we've got to make sure everything is faith-based, and this church does a great job of everything they do is by the Bible. And that's why I love it so much. Everything is by the Bible, including Celebrate Recovery. It's all by the book, the book, right? But find it, this is a tough one. Find an accountability partner or a sponsor. The road to recovery is not a journey to be made alone. And if you've ever tried it alone, you know how tough it is. You know it's tough. Don't try it alone because it's going to be rough on you. But find that accountability partner or be an accountability partner to someone else. Because I see people come up here and get these chips. And this is how, this is so awesome. We get to celebrate those big numbers, right? What do those big numbers mean? Those big numbers mean we're that much closer to helping somebody else come through it. Those big numbers mean, hey, I've made it this far. I'm going to help somebody else come along with me. That's what accountability partners do. You start taking your experience and using it to bring somebody to Christ. I've heard a lot of people say, Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. That's where we're at, right? Bring them to Christ. But uh, so as we, as we leave this, I want to leave you with just let you know how much you're, you're, you're encouraging me, you're encouraging my family and what you do and how you do it. And you are an amazing group of people. And you know what? Especially this time of year, how many other things could we be doing on Friday rather than sitting here? There's a lot, right? But you've made it a priority to come here and celebrate recovery. And that is amazing. That is so amazing. And I thank you for coming here and doing that. And if you say, you know what? I have not yet accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but I've heard about this God stuff, and I wouldn't mind trying that. If that's you today, when we have a closing song, come up here. Pastor Mike will come up and pray with you. I'll pray with you. There's several people here that will pray with you. Don't carry it on. This is the end of 2022. Let's leave this trouble behind us. Let's move forward with the new year and leave the baggage of 2022 and 2022. And if you need to come up here and pray tonight, this is the place to do it. Don't take that crap home with you anymore. Don't do it. I see Mary. I know sometimes I say the word crap and she's like, I can't say that. I can't say that. I don't say that. But you know what? When we deal with the things we all deal with, that's what it is, isn't it? That's what it is, and we're sick of it. We're not going to take it any longer. So if that's you tonight, come up during our closing song. Let Pastor Mike pray for you. This is his last full duty, right? We want to get the best out of it, right? We want to put him to work. Absolutely. 
All right, stand with me, and we're going to have our closing prayer, serenity prayer. Please say with me, Father God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking Jesus' did, sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So I may be reasonably happy in this life, supremely happy with you forever in the next. In Jesus' name. Let us close with a quick word of prayer. Then during the final song, if you need prayer, come up here and get it tonight. Don't take this stuff home with you. This is where it starts. This is where you leave that spiritual inventory, that spiritual baggage, because we've been doing inventory, and there's a lot of good inventory, but there's still some of that bad, right? That's what we need to pick out and get rid of. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, we pray, Lord God, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you guide, guard, and protect us as we come to the altar, Lord. May you cast away the evil that wants to dwell within us and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Thank you for each individual here tonight. And I pray a hedge of protection upon them as they go from this place. May they be able to cast out those evil thoughts and cast out the evil actions as they come to their mind, Lord. I just pray for them all and thank you for all of them. We just lift them up in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you.